Sarah Hirani, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me on. We're excited to have you on. Uh, I understand it's day eight in the MIQ for you. I heard an interview you did in about day two or three, and you were really excited about having two weeks, sort of put the feet up and rest and recharge. How are you feeling on day eight? Not too bad, probably. Um, I was probably a lot more relaxed on day two than what I am now, but um, my friends have been sending me some things I need to do. So I've got a puzzle today and a Lego piece. I'm making like a shoe. Um, which has got me going good. So, yeah, the next few days will be pretty busy with that. But, um, yeah, definitely got a good week of relaxation and a lot of sleep done, so it was awesome. So more relaxed on day two. Does that mean you're getting a bit over it or excited about <laughs> getting out, or is that just all sort of building? I think a bit of both. Like, I'm really excited to get home now. Um, I suppose when we came in, like, my body was still pretty sore from the tournament and, hadn't had a lot of sleep because I don't normally sleep after tournaments it's just kind of my process of coming down from a tournament and then so it was awesome I got real good sleep and and whatnot and then now you've kind of hit a routine again and tr like almost waking up normal time and so you've got the whole day to fill so yeah just trying to keep myself um entertained and now that the Olympics is finished as well so I don't sit in front of the tv the whole 12 hours watching the Olympics which was awesome last week um, but yeah, like I said, got a couple of challenges I've got from my mates that I want to do and um, yeah, they're getting me stumped today, to be honest. Have you got a go-to TV series that you're binging on at the moment in between as well? I have. My husband gave it to me. He's a pretty uh, big Marvel fan, so um, the new Loki on Disney Plus has been good. I'm halfway through it at the moment. Nice. Is, is there a, I mean, obviously your, your team's all in this together. Do you have scheduled sort of FaceTimes or group meets like to get you through each day? Uh, probably not scheduled, but um, I would say I've talked to most of the girls um, like over FaceTime or, or whatnot over the last few days. And a couple of them I'd probably chat to, like one I actually talked to for like an hour and a half on FaceTime and um, so I wonder what we even talk about. I don't know, but the time went pretty quickly, which was nice. And then um, we've got like a group chat um, that we've been oh, just constant people putting TikToks and videos and just heaps of stuff that goes on there. So that definitely, if you missed it for about half an hour, you've pretty much missed about two weeks of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand it must be frustrating being in the situation in MIQ, but it also must be frustrating answering these same questions because I know you've been super popular. You've done about five of these podcasts already, probably a million interviews. Um, but first of all, we should say huge congratulations on the gold medal. And it was so awesome. Me and Shay followed it very closely. Um, we are so excited to talk to you tonight and learn more about you, but also share in your triumph. So yeah, awesome. Congratulations and looking forward to crack into it. Uh, thank you guys. Like, I don't think I'm going to get sick of talking about it and that might sound a bit arrogant, but she's when you've worked so hard for something and your whole team comes through and you all achieve it. So it's pretty nice to talk about. So um, I'm happy to do it. The way we start things at Between Two Beers is we tell the audience how we know the guests. So Shay, how do you know Sarah? Um, first time actually having a conversation with you, but I was lucky enough um, it's the Fast Fours that was in Hamilton, um, precursor to the first time the Blackfern Sevens played a World Series league, I was actually the team liaison officer for China. So I was driving the minivan and taking them back and forth <laughs> from the hotel um, to training and to the stadium. And um, I was lucky enough, all the teams were staying in the same hotel. Blackfern Sevens were there. I know your former physio, Nicole Armstrong, from a, a former life through football as well. So... Um, observed from a distance, I was super, super impressed. Siri probably don't know my background, but I've done a few things with New Zealand football, team manager, team operations stuff. So I was really curious to see how the, the various teams, not just the Blackfin Sevens, but all the teams um, operated and how they were around team hotels. And I was thoroughly, I'm not just saying this because you're a guest, but I was thoroughly impressed with the way that your team particularly conducted themselves. I stole a whole bunch of ideas on how to do things. Um, music became a really big part of our tours and stuff that we did, and I've taken that through. So it was awesome to, to observe. 
Um, and great to finally talk to you now. I guess I think mine's a bit more personal experience than yours is, Steve. Yeah, that was nice, Jay. Um, I just know you from from what you've been doing on my screen. Um, you were uh, so I work at the Herald. I'm uh, one of the online editors there. Um, your interview, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, I think James McConey had a tweet. Uh, they should put that interview into Papa, and it was the front page story of the hero. One of our most popular stories of the whole Olympics. Um, you with the bandage and the black eye, and um, that was really incredible. So yeah, I've I've been excited. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one. I've already seen them. Yeah, we've been, we've both been fanboying all day. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> The other thing we like to do is we like to give the audience a little bit of perspective on the guest from someone else who knows you well. And I reached out to a, a former uh, colleague, a uh, teammate of yours, uh, Honey Hidemi Smiler, and I asked her, because she wrote a column in the Herald that said um, you were one of the best, best leaders that she'd ever played with, uh, and she's obviously had an incredible career. So I, I called her and asked her to expand on it, and I just want to read out what she said. She said, uh, Gossie is the most outstanding leader I've ever had the pleasure to play alongside. She's so genuine. What you see is what you get. She's not judgmental and comes across as very approachable but honest. There's no fakeness there. I've known Gossie since she was 18, and she didn't necessarily chase leadership roles, but perhaps wasn't aware of her own ability in terms of leadership. You could almost pinpoint a time when she was 20 that you knew she was destined to be a future leader. She had a real genuine aura about her. You get the sense within a minute of talking to her that she just oozes trust, which is one of her key attributes. She's so reliable and trustworthy. But she also handles the ugly stuff of being a leader well, calling people out and fronting up to difficult situations. There's been many situations when senior players who are much older than her needed a hard conversation, but she does it with real empathy and genuine respect. And once the conversation is done, that's it. There's no ongoing judgment or backstabbing. She just gets on with it. She's a one in a million girl. Now, imagine hearing something like Jesus. that about yourself is, <laughs> is quite I'll nice. Pay, I'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But to hear that from Honey, who's obviously had, like I said, the, the career and, and, and everything that's gone along with it. Um, when you hear, hear her talking about a le you as a leader like that, do, does that sound right to you? Do, do you understand the person she's talking about? I think I'm going to cry, sure, that's the nicest thing I think I've ever heard anyone talk about me before, but like coming from her, like I respect her a lot as a person, as a rugby player, um, as a mum, and like to have someone like that speak highly of you is, oh that's, yeah I don't even, it's pretty speechless really, but like she was someone who pretty much took me under their wing um, when I was young, a young kid at school and went over to Rome with the Aotearoa Māori Women's Sevens team. So I've known her for a long time and she was a senior player in my group. So yeah, hard to have those words from her spoken about me is yeah, pretty special. So I have to give her a message after this. Look yeah, well, of... hopefully hopefully that paints a little bit of a picture. She, she goes on, on more. Um, she said that when you took first took on the role of the sevens captain, there was a lot of stuff happening in the team that was difficult. You said you were given the role with uh, Huriyanga was injured and half the squad were good friends with Huri and some questioned your right to be captain, but you stood strong. Uh, you had to really earn the trust of the squad who were loyal to Huri. And you did that over and over again, proving that you were right for the role. So obviously now Olympic gold medalist, you're, you're seen as this great leader, but can you reflect back on that time at the very start of your your role as a leader, as a young leader, and, and the challenges that you had to overcome? Yeah, to be honest, like back then um, was some of the hardest leadership moments that I've ever had to go through. And being right at the start of your um, your career as a leader, and pretty much a career as a professional rugby player, like I sometimes I probably wanted to give up, but it was like my support network, my family, my partner telling me like that you, it's going to be okay and there's going to be times like this, but just to stick at it. So there was, yeah, it was challenging at times. And like Honey said that there were people really invested in, in Hoodie and, and I understand that like the friendship was there, the relationship was there. And obviously Hoodie had um, played a lot of um, like international footy for the Black Ferns. So 
when that changeover happened, it was it was really difficult actually. Um, I was young. I suppose I was still trying to find myself as a rugby player and as a person, and it just took time. Um, and yeah, I suppose buying that time um, paid dividends to like now with how I approach leadership and and stuff like that. But yeah, at the time it was really difficult, and um, there were a few yeah I suppose moments in that time where I was, uh, wanted to not really be there if that makes sense yeah it does it does make sense um and, and being becoming a leader so early um and such a young leader now I mean you're still quite young you've still got so many years to go you, you know have you reached are you still learning as a leader are you still learning as a as a captain yeah, every day I'm learning and I learn, I now get to learn off the best leaders in the world, which is so amazing for me. Like, um, I'm only 28, so I find that quite young, but in our team, it's actually quite old, which is disappointing. But I'm pretty sure most of those young girls think I'm like 35, just for how long I've been a leader for. Um, but it's like awesome. So at the moment, like in our team, we've got such a cool leadership group that my job's really easy. Like, yeah, I have to stand at the front when we walk onto the field and um, I tend to do a lot of the talking but a lot of the work done from the other leaders behind closed doors and when we're actually off the pitch is why it makes it so easy for me to be um, a captain and, and lead the team at the moment so like I'm actually really really grateful for the people I have around me and what they do to create a culture that allows everyone to be who they want to be. We had um, BJ Watling on last episode, the, the recently retired uh, Black Cat, and one of the questions we asked him was the role of, of captain and coach in cricket, which is an interesting one because the captain tends to make a lot of the calls. Um, with sevens being such a, a tight time frame for a game, is it the same in your sport as well? Are you calling a lot of the shots as the game's being played or are you getting feedback from from Alan, I imagine it's quite, that's such a tight time frame to, to make those instant decisions. Yeah, that's probably something that we've changed since 2016 up until now is like our coaching staff wanted us to be good enough to make decisions in the moment. And so a lot of our trainings were, um, they would prepare us as well as they can. And then some trainings they'll be like, you just need to go for it and make your own decisions. We're not going to say anything. If something happens, then you just have to learn and adapt in the moment. And um, so it took a couple of years for that to happen and then there was a point, to be honest, I can't even remember the ex exact year, but our coaching staff said, okay, I'm not going to say anything in team huddles anymore. Like, you have to be able to do this yourself. And I think that was the real pivotal moment where the leaders had to stand up and especially myself, um, Tyler Nathan Wong and Kelly Brazier being the game leaders, the rugby leaders. Um, so for me, like, it took time and it was hard and when you're absolutely shattered at half time and you have to say something and get everyone's attention like that was really a difficult time but you learn to do it um and the i suppose the trust that the coaches have in us um was awesome because now i think we're i think our team's one of the best teams at making decisions on the go adapting um because once we get to game day like they're like it's up to you guys you guys have all the tools that we have given you over the last few months and just go for it so if you see our huddles um our coach actually doesn't say anything and hasn't done for a very long time now so yeah it's it's pretty cool like I feel I've learned a lot about rugby and making better decisions and actually knowing exactly where you are on the game clock what score is what do you need to do to win and yeah just things like that I think that's how we get ourselves out of tough situations on the field we had a couple of tough situations in the Olympics, and I think Steve's going to uh, intro one of those moments, and maybe you can talk us through how you handled it. Yeah, so 21-0 uh, down against Great Britain. Um, and so afterwards, so there's, I should say that there's, there's been three really amazing uh, Sky Sport interviews that we're going to get to. So I just want to play a little clip. So you went 21-0 down, and then uh, Ruby Tui in the after-match interview uh, <laughs> talked a little bit about what went on. <laughs> what did um, Sarah say to you at half time then? To be honest, like, have you ever been a poo cutter before? 
you explain it to us. Yeah, it was, it was more the ice. Um, but no, she just she just told us that's not good enough. That's not doing the black juice proud. And um, jokes aside, this means a heck of a lot. We've been away from our fans for a long time, so just absolutely blast that. It's, um, but the cool thing is, we hit each other's back, could pat each other on the back, put our hand up, say sorry, look each other in the eye, still through all those mistakes. So yeah, you get the. Case. But that halftime team talk. I mean, she's saying you gave the pukana eyes. Do you remember exactly that scene? What you said? What what happened? Nah, to be honest, like I, I had said it probably before <laughs> the halftime talk. There was like a couple of moments where it made a couple of errors, and I just remember like you give your teammate a look, and you know they like they know they're fucked up. You don't need to be like, come on, what are you up to? Because they know enough. They feel disappointed that they've let the team down a little bit. Um, so it was just like an instant look, like, are you gonna sort it out or or what? And then you just get the, oh yep, yep, my bad. So. It's probably those kind of conversations during the game that you kind of have with players and there's times where people have had to do it to me and, and it's just a, like more of a like, well, it looks, probably looks like a poo kind of, but it's like, are you all good? Like, do you need some love or, um, and then you yeah, obviously we turned around, so it was okay. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to build into um, Tokyo because there's so many amazing uh, aspects to cover. But the one I want to start with is that game against Fiji, the semi-final, um, which was one of the most thrilling, nerve-wracking <laughs> games of the whole competition. So 12-12 with two minutes left. It looked like Fiji were going to score for all money. They had a breakaway down the left. Portia Woodman somehow pulls their winger down, like a last ditch, pulls her down. I think you might have passed it to her. She's like dead on her feet. She's she was absolute, gone, absolutely, absolutely done. exhausted. And then with 30 <laughs> seconds to go, New Zealand score, you make it 17-12, miss the conversion, and then with one, I think there was one second left on the clock, yeah. uh, they get the ball back and they score, take it to extra time. And then in extra time, it's Stacey Fleur's, recovers that incredible kickoff like what a moment like such a, a game of inches and then your magic leads to New Zealand scoring and you get through to the final I mean wow what a game that was <laughs> and, and those those are the moments though right that your coach and management team are completely powerless they're sitting like the rest of us are just watching it pan out and in those moments are you conscious of the things that are happening or is it do you go into autopilot and you're just in like athletes describe it's just in zen and it's just unfolding as it does no i think that was probably one of the games at the olympics where i remember looking around and i was like she's like i know we have this and i know we've got the best players in the world but there was a feeling in that game where we'd almost sat back on our heels a little bit and like i don't think we were complacent or anything i think when you're in a semi-final and for us as New Zealanders like we'd gone there to win gold that's like we were pretty open and honest about that and when a team who has never beat us before were testing us like the way that they did like I think well I don't know I haven't actually really talked to them but I'm just going to say they were a um, <laughs> couple of the players were feeling pressure from the moment and um, and so I remember looking around and thinking geez this is like this is a kind of moment in my leadership as a captain, like I really need to be on here. And so like my job just becomes around like a, almost like an energy energizer bunny, just trying to get people up, um, trying to remind them of why, how good they are, what we need to do, giving them one job just to make sure that we were like in taking moments as we can. And like there was times in that those games that we definitely have should have sealed the win off before we went into extra time but games happen like that sevens is the way that it is and um and yeah, you just like there was a there was probably that time in the extra time and to be honest I haven't really told anyone this is there was like the kickoff and normally our first five and oh sorry normally Teresa and um Ruby make the call on the kickoff and they asked me what what I reckon and I said, oh, I'll just go with your gut. And they said two, um, which is not the way that Stacey was on. And I remember thinking, I remember walking away and going, yep, yep, sweet as I trust you. And then I just, I don't know, I had this feeling like 
no, nah, I need to kick it to Stacey. Um, so she was on the other side and I remember thinking, oh, no, nah, I want to change the call. So I changed it. I said, no, nah, we're kicking to Stacey. And this was a real late call. And I remember Tyler looking at me like, what the hell? Why have you made this call so late? And then she ended up getting the ball back. And I was like, oh, thank God I listened to my gut. Like, they, they, And I just thought, she's if we had an of, I don't know what would have happened. But like just times like that, I'm like, lucky I I don't know, lucky I just trust myself to make those kind of calls. So, yeah, there's certain parts in that game where you just think, holy hell, you just think, wish things had gone a different way. But I'm glad that you've got players like Stacey, like Gail, um, who just stood up, I thought, in those semi-final moments and, yeah, got us across the line. That's, that's a pretty euphoric moment, right? There's only, like you say, not many people know that. There's probably only a handful that were actually aware of the, 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 your decision, which worked out so well. Like, that's a really special moment when you do win for you guys just to yeah, appreciate that together. Yeah, and, like, yeah, to be honest, I haven't actually really talked to the girls about that. Like, we haven't had a time to talk about rugby and actually break down uh, what the games were like, but I'm sure over the next few weeks when we're out at MIQ that there'll be a few yarns about stuff like that. So, yeah. So, How hyped, leading into that uh, gold medal match, I mean, how hyped do you guys get in the changing room? Or is it all about level head when you get to, to that point? It, it's not, you're not trying to get everyone g Everyone knows their jobs, you're just trying to be professional. Or is it, I mean, is it the biggest game of your life and you can't help but feel that extra sort of buzz? Oh, like this, you don't need much to get girls hyped, to be honest. <laughs> On a normal day, it's pretty, it's pretty up there, uh, whether we're playing or training or just having a day off. But like that's one thing that our girls can do is when they need a switch, that will instantly happen. And um, like it's, it's awesome. I think that we're really well balanced in our group. Like the, we can, um, we'll finish a game like, the lights go off, everyone's asleep, like gone. And then like you just can see everyone will wake up and then it's like an instant change. There'll be like music playing, girls are dancing, singing, having a good time. And then like another song will come on, the Aotearoa by Stan Walker will come on and it's like, okay, sweet, it's game mode. So like there's changes in energy in the in the team and um, before the final, before every final um, and after the warm up, everyone comes in um, we put our jerseys on, which is a really special moment. Um, the management are all in there, and we give each other hugs and um, and say last minute words to each other. And then it's actually just about like you can see the smiles, you see the energy. And I don't think it was much different to um, a lot of the other finals we've played in, but there was a like a real um, sense of like we just need to do the basics really well there wasn't anything special that needed to happen um, but as long as we did our jobs like just our own individual jobs and as a collective we were going to be sweet and you could feel the energy the excitement but like just the pure focus in the group and I think from the management and all the players so it was a really nice feeling heading into that final. Do you still do the thing where you stay connected with each other when you're moving to and from warm up to dressing room, and you you talk us through that because not everybody's been lucky enough like me to see it. Um, and there's there's like affirmations and stuff as well. Have, have I got that right? Like you're telling each other that you love each other and I've got your back and all that stuff. Like it's it's like it's a sight to behold if you've been lucky enough to to see it. It's pretty cool. Do you still do that stuff? Yeah, we actually um, stole that from the men's team um, when we were just a new program eight years ago and that obviously being a well-established winning program, we they do that. And so we thought that would be a really cool idea to connect and we've done that ever since. And it's been, it's awesome. Like I think um, sometimes, although we go to tournaments and I think the Olympics were the same, like the walk's actually really, really long. So you kind of wait and connect a little bit closer or else it just becomes... Um, quite sore people's shoulders but um yeah so we'll always and you can hold like shoulder um short or wherever you want to hold but it's just about being as close as possible and there's there's some girls who are absolutely awesome at it and they will constantly talk the whole way up until warm up from warm up back to the changing field back to the changing room to the game like just the constant chatter and those are the ones who always bring energy 
Um, and it's not like it's a written rule that you talk more than others, but there's some that are awesome at bringing energy and will constantly tell you they've got their back. Constantly, like, yeah, just say stuff that, like you said, like, you love you and, um, and like, I'll work for you, I'm, I'm here and stuff like that. And at the front, when you're hearing that behind you, like, there's just like a massive, um, oh, you just feel extremely proud to be standing in front of these people who are genuinely excited and got your back. So when did you know you had gold? I think you were 14 points up with about two minutes to go and you had a penalty or something like that. Like I know that you, you never counted until the final whistle and all that sort of stuff, but did you have a little internal celebration at that point or was there a point earlier that you knew it was yours? No, that, that moment there, like when we got that penalty of two minutes to go um, and we're 14 points up, that was, I didn't say it out loud, but in my head I'm like, we've got this, like, and all I need to do is just make decisions to kill time now. So, like, if you see, we, I'm pretty, I'm normally pretty keen on quick taps and like keeping the game flow. But when you're two converted tries ahead and you've got momentum, like, it's just about killing time. And so, for us, we kicked the corner, got another penalty. Um, I ended up quick tapping. I thought Porsche was going to score, but that's all good. And then we got another one and just took a scrum, like scrums and sevens are a massive time waster I think like you can kill a good two minutes just in one scrum so um yeah I think during those moments and you can see there's clips of Michaela Blyde already smiling and we haven't even set the scrum yet because you just know and you're like okay all we need to do is kick the ball out because we've actually won which is yeah it was a nice feeling I think and I know my family's in well there's a New Zealand appreciated that their hearts were a little bit at ease at that game Th those those are the moments which make the Olympics so good. Is that yes, they're winning these these tournaments and they're gold and the gold medal. But you understand how much work goes into it. Four years, or in some cases more, of build up for that moment. And then you see when they win gold, that outpouring of emotion, that raw tears, and it's just everything you've worked so hard for is there has been achieved. Um, some of those scenes uh, straight after the match, I was watching them again this afternoon. They bring a tear to your eye no matter how many times you've seen them. Like the, the emotion is so raw, right? Yeah, it is. It's like it means a lot to us. We, you wouldn't give up. I wouldn't say give up your life or sacrifice because that's just what I want to do and I love it. But you've, um, there's just a lot of time that goes into those kind of moments. And for the last five years, like I've visualised winning, um, wearing a gold medal, standing on the podium, listening to the national anthem, um, celebrating with my families and the people who have helped. So when that actually happens, it's like instantly a bit of relief because you're like, oh, holy, I don't have to think about that vision anymore, which will be nice. Um, and I won't have to worry about training or um, just anything. Like there's been tournaments that we've lost that I, I will wake up in the middle of the night thinking about what could I have done better? Did I do everything I can? Was my routine good enough? So I knew at that moment, I was like, I can actually fully genuinely celebrate because we're finished. It's done. We've done what we achieved. Or we've um, got what we achieved and what we've worked for. So I think that's why everyone cried. Uh, everyone was smiling. Um, and the embrace was so like, yeah, it was so crazy because of all of that we all felt that over the last five years I, I don't know and I know we'll we'll get back to the to your to the Blackfin sevens and your particular situation as well but I and maybe I'm just hypersensitive to it but I feel like a lot of the celebrations be it Tom Walsh's bronze um some of the cycling medals as well some of those those post competition interviews they just seem so charged with emotion and I wonder whether that is just a reflection of post COVID reality and as you've identified, the sacrifices or the choices, I think Eric Murray put it best on one of our other, um, on one of our previous podcasts where he says opportunity cost um, mm. that people have put into it. But did it feel that way when you, and I know you didn't get much of a chance because you were on a charter flight almost straight away, but when you're interacting with other New Zealand athletes or even on the plane on the way home, did it feel that much more special? 
like I think I got that feeling as soon as Hayden um, won his medal in the triathlon. He, he won that bronze, and like we watched the triathlon on um, on our phones and seen him pour out his emotions for what he was going through, and and then we were lucky enough to be in the village, so we got to welcome him back in with a with a haka and. Um, so like instantly you just feel that connection with someone who's gone to a games, won a medal for their country and you just feel what they're going through. And so you just instantly think, I want to do that. And I want to be able to give back to New Zealand, um, in the same kind of sense. So I think COVID allowed that to, allowed that forum to happen with, um, the, like the New Zealand team being so connected like that. And then... I think also COVID put a lot of people's lives into perspective when the games might not have happened. Um, like, what are people going to do without their job? Like, because this is people's job. Um, and then, like, people had to work an extra 18 months just to get to the start line. So I think once you finish and you can you see people's emotions, it's because it's, it's time. Um, well, it's time away from family um it's like an extra 18 months of hard work and, and and everything that goes into it so I loved when people showed different emotions because you're like yeah I feel that I get what they're going through so yeah it was nice to be able to play a little bit later in the Olympics because you just got everyone's energy and I think as soon as we got to do ours then yeah along with um, the rest of New Zealand team Talking of, of uh, emotion is a nice little seg into the next clip uh, that I want to play. Um, it was one of the highlights of the games for me again. It was your interview with uh, Ricky Swinnell following the gold medal, which I'll play now. Sarah Hironi, I finally get to say to you, Olympic gold medalist. What is going through your mind at the moment? <laughs> It's so hard to go I'm like, oh, I'm just uh, so happy. I love you, Mum. I love you so much. I want to see you. I'm just so grateful to be a part of the best team in the world. Um, and our team has been through a lot in five years, and we're bringing home a gold medal for New Zealand, and I could not be more proud. Man, hearing that every single time I hear it gives me absolute goosebumps. Um, I know, like I said, it blew up on the Herald across social media. Um, I'm tearing up now, uh, just sort of talking about it. It's so charged with it's it's so raw and it's so beautiful. Um, and yeah, it, it just came out right. Yeah, like I'm happy to share. I probably cry, but it's all good too. Um, like I think the last six months have been extremely hard like um yeah my mum uh tragically passed away on her birthday actually at the end of February so it was extremely unexpected for our family and just to have to yeah just go through that and watch my dad um I suppose struggle over the five months has been really hard so um, like I took some time away and just spent a lot of time with my family and then there was like a point where not that I had to choose to go back to rugby and try and carry on but there was a like I like I know how much goes into a game and I know how much training and, and effort gets put in and there was two of my best mates who are in the team Cows and Porsche were with me with my family and I knew that us being away from the team was hindering their their chance and stuff as well so um yeah that was hard to leave my family to go back to try and train and there was a lot of times like cows and P would come pick me up from my house drag me out of bed get me to the fields just so we could get some reps in um so when we went back to the team that I was we were all in a good place to to carry on so like I owe a lot to those two girls they um yeah mean a lot to me but definitely sacrificed a lot for to come and help and support me and my family so it was like I think an easy decision to come back that I knew that this is what I wanted and I knew that my mum would be really happy if I carried on um but obviously then really hard to be away from my family and traveling without my husband around is, is pretty difficult so 
Um, but then, like, when I was, I suppose, at the Olympics, like, I knew what my job was. And I think that's why I was so in games. I was so in the moment because I'm like, there's no point in being anywhere else because if I be somewhere else, then I'm not going to get this moment for what it is. And, yeah, so then once it finished, then it was just like a, oh, I suppose, a, yeah, instant emotional roller coaster of I'm so happy. Um, but, geez, I wish my mum was here. Um, like, so, yeah, there was like a, I suppose, a spiritual connection with her being in the um, and stand having a beer, probably bawling her eyes out with a big smile face. So, like, I wanted to wave to her. The girls obviously knew what I was up to, so did the same thing. And, um, yeah, it was – and then the interview just – yeah, everyone knew who I was playing for, what I was what I was up to. So saying it out loud, I think, if it helps someone else express their emotions and, um, yeah, it's okay to cry. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. It makes me feel a lot better if I let it out. So, Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that as, as someone, I lost my dad 10 years, uh, what are we, 2021, 11 years ago now, um, still stings, um, you know, it still stings every now and again, things will set you off, um, but you've also had to, to, to go through some of your grief quite publicly as well, um, I can't imagine how difficult that must be as well to to be asked, to be reminded, to, to talk about it. There must be some times where you, you just don't want to face up to it. Or does that make the achievements that you've you've had so much more special as well? I think for me, like, we're a pretty honest family and I've been lucky where, like, my, well, my dad's a farmer. He doesn't normally talk about his emotions. And before this, I hadn't seen him cry and or anything like that. And he was, oh, he obviously, like, showed us a lot of attention and love, but, he was just your typical farmer and that was it and I you know but since then like the way how close we've got um like even in quarantine he's rung me every night even if we just I just ask him how the sheep and cows are and he's like yep good I'm like okay so see you tomorrow like, <laughs> that's the kind of convo we have but so like but hearing him pour his emotions out to us me my sister and my brother um and me and my sister are obviously really close and talk most days more because I um, want to talk to her two kids, her two young kids. But, like, we've just constantly had, like, back and forth, like, if there's a day we're not good, like, it's just an instant message and someone will ring you. And, like, same with, like, my husband, my sister's husband and, and that. But so I think being able to be really open with each other and, um, like I um, will constantly be in tears. My husband's just right there. The girls know, like I've cried in meetings and left meetings, left training, but they just know that I'm okay, but I just need a bit of time. And I, I'm not afraid to cry in public. I'm not afraid to express how I'm feeling because I don't want to hold it in and I don't want to be a person that holds it in and then it happens a little bit later like if I'm feeling it then I'm just going to express everything I can because it makes me feel so much better and if that is in the public eye and I have like Ricky was interviewing me um I class Ricky is a good mate so I was happy to share that moment with her and um and then it's nice like your family message you and they're like I was crying with you like I love you and so yeah for me it's just about like I'm pretty good at showing my emotions like um, externally. So, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to express that that's, that's not a challenge for me. I think doing that is, is really good if you can allow yourself to do that. And, yeah, it's oh, well, for crying TV, then probably make other people cry too. It's, it's interesting. Stephen and I have been doing this for three years now. Is it three years, Steve? Two. Two. Oh, God, I've got ahead of myself. <laughs> but when... Um, <laughs> When Emma Twig won gold, we messaged each other and we were both just super emotional about that as well. We've been lucky enough to have her on the podcast and there's something about that shared joy to see someone triumph that you have some sort of a, a connection with just makes it more special. And your personal journey for this particular Olympics started with you as a flag bearer for our country as well, which must have been an amazing uh honor to be bestowed on you also yeah what a couple of weeks at the olympics um 
something I would <laughs> never ever have dreamed of happening to be honest like Bagberry and winning gold in the same Olympics is quite nuts for me but um, like a similar kind of thing with getting told you're going to be the flag bearer of your country um, like I was actually speaking to this Rob Woodell rang me on a phone call and I was just at training one day and I just didn't say anything to him he carried on the conversation and I just cried and then he asked me how I was feeling and I said oh yeah pretty good but I think I need to go now and just hung up and then had to bring him back that night um, and I remember walking out of I was down a corridor and one of the girls goes like I was obviously crying the girl said are you all right and I said oh yeah you know it's just you know and I just said that because obviously I'd been crying a lot over the last few months. So they were like, oh, yeah, sweet. <laughs> and then we just went into a meeting and everything was all good. So it was, it was nice that I could hide it that way. But yeah, when I got to tell my family about that, geez, it was, um, yeah, that was pretty amazing. And then obviously doing it was even more amazing. It went so quickly. Um, but yeah, just, oh, it was so special. And it's just a huge honour, like, me and David were absolutely buzzing. I felt like a kid on Christmas Day just because of, you know how special it is. You know the people who have done it in the past. And, yeah, to be doing it um, was was absolutely amazing. Did, did you have to do a rock, paper, scissors to see who would actually hold the flag? Or did you pull <laughs> did you pull rank because you were, you know, David, as good as he is, he was a ringer. <laughs> Should have been Bondi. <laughs> it's funny because I think, like, because only the TV showed half of it, and that was the half that I got. I get to share the flag with him. He got the second half. Uh, if we didn't see it, it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but my family actually gave me a bit of slack about that too. They said, oh, did you not want to give him the flag? I was like, I did. <laughs> but we we got the flag like, I don't know, like 500 metres before we got to the stadium. And... um we were kind of talking about what we were going to do and he initially said that I should carry it um, because of what had happened and I just said look I'm happy to both share it like we both um, deserve this honour so um, then we got a bit closer and he said oh no I'm pretty keen again and and I was like yep sweet and then Robert Dow said he had a message from someone who was watching the games and they just said oh don't hold it together it looks real awkward it looks like you're trying to pull it off each other Um, (laughs) and then it's real hard to wave and stuff so I just said, oh, I said to him, oh, look, how about we just take half each? Um, and he was like, yep, so you go first half, I'll go second half, and then we can have our moment, have nice photos and whatnot. So that's what happened. But then obviously on New Zealand TV, I got looked like I stole the flag off him. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little I'm bit really greedy now, well. actually. <laughs> <laughs> just before we leave the flag stuff, so how early in the piece did you get told by Rob Waddell that you would be doing it? Because the team travelled to, to Townsville, and was there a was there a, a ceremony here before you left? Have I got that right? Yes, I was real lucky. Like I don't think they do this, but I think because of COVID they had to. Um, I got named like a week. Oh, it might have been two weeks before we were leaving to Townsville because then the week before we left they had to quickly organise a um a cloaking because I was going to Townsville the day before of the actual Auckland ceremony where Hamish um, Bond got cloaked. So, like, she thanks New Zealand Olympic Committee to changing their stuff and coming to Tauranga and doing it in front of our team. So I got my whole team um, because I knew I got to invite, I think they thought that I was going to invite, like, maybe my immediate family. I ended up inviting, like, my whole family. Because <laughs> I, I mean, they were like, how many people have you told? I'm like, oh, not many. There was probably about 20 people there, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> but I knew that, like, I needed to share this um, this with the rest of my family, who at the time were going for a, a rough time. So, yeah, it was pretty awesome. And then my whole family stayed at my house for the weekend before I left, and, like, just everything was, was amazing. So... Yeah, I'm really grateful that I got to find out a bit earlier, got cloaked, um, and then, yeah, and then obviously once we got to the games, everyone already knew anyway, so that was special. Do you think if someone had told you 15 years ago that you would be the first Māori <laughs> woman to be a flag bearer at the Olympics and you would win Olympic gold, like, that is better than you possibly could have imagined, like, your career to get to? Oh, crazy, crazy times, like. I would be like, no, nah, you're dreaming. Like, maybe a gold medal because I'm really determined, but the flag bearer, like, no way. 
I will never get picked for something like that. So, yeah, now you just, like, I think for me it's like just about getting home now and actually celebrating both of that stuff with my family and I absolutely can't wait so um yeah obviously hearing it over FaceTime has been really cool but when you get a message from your husband just saying okay can you and your gold medal hurry up now then yeah, I'm pretty keen to get home <laughs> how many FaceTimes with uh with Booker have you had <laughs> every day I actually talked to him tonight and he ignored me on the call so I'm a bit gutted by that <laughs> Uh, that's the uh, that's Sarah and Con's dog for those that aren't uh, that aren't aware. <laughs> okay, yeah, last. Yeah, not my husband. Uh, he wasn't ignoring me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, last video I want to get your comment on, and and this is the one that's gone viral. Um, Four point five million views on Twitter. Uh, Ruby Tui, I'm just going to play a little bit. A word on GB because you don't get to play against the GB side very often. Obviously, obviously you play against England and Scotland, but what have you made of them here at the, this uh, tournament? You know, I love how GB come together. Eh? Like, you know, they all spot up. I think mean, for the Lombard Zero Freeze, it's funny because on the scrum they probably hate me saying this. Sorry, Abby. But when they go down, they go, England! Like, they're real, you know, proud to be in it, but they can't know you. So Abby's going to go, GB! When she goes down, so like, you know, everybody comes together in Scotland. So, four point five. Yeah, tell me about the character of Ruby Tui and tell me about when you guys realised that this thing was blowing up <laughs> bigger than anything in the history of New Zealand sport. It's funny because, like, we all like, know Ruby is that Ruby person. Is like, person. Like, she's been like she's that been since she came into the programme eight, nine eight, years ago. Um, um, so whenever she does stuff, everyone's just like, oh, yeah, it's just Ruby talking yarns again. So <laughs> for us, we're like, oh, yeah, this is normal. But when you hear like the media going nuts about it and it's got this many views you're like oh my gosh like you obviously haven't talked to ruby uh, you haven't listened ruby talked your ear off every single day for eight years like that. that's where we're at at the moment <laughs> so that's just normal ruby that's normal ruby like you she is the wittiest person i know like you'll be in a serious room with like big top dogs that he's fought and whatnot and she can crack a joke like or a pun out of anything like and that's why our team's so so awesome is they will just show themselves as they are and like on obviously like a big news channel and they just don't care like they're going to talk the way they normally talk and I suppose that's why our team's so so good because people just who they are and express the way that they want to what does Ruby Tui's phone look like after something like that? Like, are her DMs blowing up from all over the world? Is she getting interview requests? Like, what does that, what does that look like? Oh, I think she's pretty busy anyway. Like, she obviously works for Sky um, before the Olympics and stuff, so she's really good on camera and knows exactly what to say but loves having her own spin on it and um she's i think she's been really busy i seen someone sent her a coffee on, coffee on uber eats which is awesome keep her tracking along <laughs> on all the media interviews but like it's funny when you talk to her like she normally just we always ask her oh what's your what's family whatsapp going like because i think she gets a lot of slack on that about what <laughs> she's up to so no i always pull that one line around her when she's been on the media too much um i think do, do people underestimate or people that aren't aware how close you are as a group, your entire group. I've seen the hashtag uh, 1 to 21. Now, is that in reference to your entire squad, not just the 12 that that made it to Tokyo? Or the 15, if you include the three travelling reserves? Yeah, like our team's really, really close. And like we talk about it and like it's easy just to say words like we're sisters and we're really close and we've got a good bond or whatever. But like, there's like a genuine like love for everyone and you can tell by our um well I suppose no one's ever going to see it but our group chats and stuff like that and the videos you send each other just how close we are and I think probably more so you'll see when we get home like we'll have some family time but most of the girls will hang out um over their leave just because you like these people and um and, and it's awesome and I think that's why we're so good and that's why people can be themselves because like there's a genuine care and you just you know how to switch off when rugby's finished and you know how to switch on when you're on the rugby field so 
yeah, we're really close. And I suppose that's what I love about this team is someone will always be there for you when they need you, when you need them. And before leaving, um, Noah Williams' uh, Instagram story or Instagram post where she learned or the reality of her not being on the plane hit, that was heavy. That was super heavy. And I guess that was one of the first times those that weren't really uh, familiar with the Blackfin 7s kind of realised, shit, this is a really... This is a really, really tight knit group. How difficult is it leaving somebody like that behind? And, and yes, there's only a certain amount of people that can get picked, so people always have to naturally miss out. But uh, those must be difficult things as well. Not really hard. And um, like there was the week where she had been told that, um, well, that her neck wasn't in a in a really good state, and obviously knowing what that meant for her. Um, just seeing her have to go through stuff and obviously that hasn't stopped for her like we haven't been home in two months she's had to live through us live, like winning an Olympic Games and I would say that's been extremely challenging because she easily could have been there um, so like I can't wait to connect in with her and obviously the other girls who unfortunately missed out before we even left to go to Townsville and the ones who came home from Townsville that's still a really challenging time for them so um yeah like I, I I really feel for her um not even like missing out but also still being injured and that, like a quite a serious injury and you just you never wish that upon anyone even if you don't like them because you just know what that means like you know what the work she's done you know that she's moved her family down from Auckland um and obviously they were easily going to do that because she wanted to follow a dream but yeah I'd like just love her a lot and um just will hopefully yeah that something good comes out of it for her but I know that um that would have been a really hard time for her and it was it was cool seeing her on tv and seeing her do her thing and um well then you watch the video of her crying and then you cry again and so mm -hmm. yeah I, I know that was hard for for us but it's obviously a lot harder for her than it was for us so yeah. yeah, that was what I was going to say. It was one of the master strokes that TVNZ did here was actually bring people in to provide expert comments comments on on the events that were happening. And she was superb in her analysis of, of Sevens. And like Eric Murray was as well, you could see everyone just sharing in that joy of that moment, regardless of whether they were directly part of it or not. And I think that's just been one of the amazing things from um, from this Olympics that we could probably – just do a whole episode on on the Olympic experience, but we've probably got to touch on a few other areas before we let you go. <laughs> Let's, um, I want to just go back to uh, the early days, uh, fielding. So start with fielding high school. Sam Whitelock, Aaron Smith, Cody Taylor, all played for the fielding high school first 15. And so did you. This is a school with a role of 1600. That's two All Blacks captains and yourself what's in the water and fielding? What, what's going on there? Oh, yeah, I don't know. It was just a really good time. Um, but, like, I loved my time at fielding high school. I loved being at um, at boarding school, and I learnt a lot. And it's funny, like, where we were there, we had a headmaster, um, Rick Francis, and at the time he used to make us do some outrageous things of, like, writing diaries, setting goals, um like just doing some things and like you always talk about being you being in like the top 20 percent of the world and as a 13 year old kid you're like what why would i like why would it even matter if i'm the top 20 percent like i'm just happy to be at school to be honest um and like and then you kind of progress over the and then i started playing rugby at fielding um at 13 because of rob jones a coach who i am still really good friends with him and his family now they still send me support send me videos before I'm playing and stuff and he's got four daughters so yeah, it's been a pretty cool relationship to have with a, um, the next teacher and um, but like I learned a lot about um, like the mental side of playing sport and I think I didn't appreciate it at the time until I left until I went into a high performance environment and then um, like a mental skills guy's talking to you and I'm like oh, I wrote all this down like three years ago I've got all this all in books at home so like yeah I was really fortunate enough to be around good people who wanted us to be better people um and wanted us to strive to 
I suppose, um, search for what you wanted in life. And um, yeah, so I'm really grateful for my time at Fielding and absolutely loved it. And yeah, me and my sister and brother went through there, went through boarding school. And I know at times my parents struggled to, to even pay for the tutoring and stuff like that that we had to go through. But I think, um, yeah, if I got a chance, then I'll definitely send my kids there. I've heard it on uh, from one of my little whisperers that you were um, a bit of a sort of a rugged farm girl. You're a bit of a, a daddy's girl. You had the golden shears and, and you got involved in all that. Um, is that accurate? Was it a real sort of... <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got my sources. <laughs> um, talk about your, your farming upbringing. Is that, was that important? Do you think that helped shape the character that you've become? Yeah, I'm definitely, um, I was a rugged rural farm girl, that's for sure. Like, I'm probably still like that. Like, um, but it's, yeah, it's been awesome, like, going from, like, a little country town or a, wasn't even a town, there was nothing there when I, where I grew up, um, right by the ranges for a few years, and then we moved closer to town to Kimbolton. But, like, I went to country schools, um, was around other farming kids, and for us it was about, like, getting to the bus stop on time because you were doing chores um like feeding the chickens and the lambs and stuff like that we went to school and most of the time me and my sister would bike to the end of the road without shoes on and going to school and you knew everyone because you were all in one class um so when someone had a birthday like the 13 year old girl in class having a birthday and you're six you'd go to the their house for their birthdays and so that was the kind of upbringing i had like it was a real community-based upbringing um, my mum was the cleaner. She drove the bus to the school, um, which was horrible at times because me and my sister would fight and she'd kick us off the bus and we'd have to walk home. Um, <laughs> but, like, that kind of upbringing was something, like, I loved it. I absolutely loved growing up on the farm. We had a lot of freedom to do what we wanted to do. We always had pet lambs and calves and my mum milked a cow. And so, like, at the age of 12, I found out that you actually could buy milk from the supermarket, that every single person didn't own a cow. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know if I had a sheltered lifestyle or uh, um, upbringing or if it was absolutely amazing. Um, but, yeah, so then I learned how to share a sheep. My dad was a golden shears champion. My mum was, um, she got second in the world one year at wool handling, so... There was a lot of things that we watched my parents do that were absolutely impressive. And, um, yeah, I know that, like, our, our upbringing with them and them teaching us how to handle pressure, how to work hard, um, just how to get stuff done when you really needed it has helped me a lot in, um, in my career in rugby and um, for me wanting to do other things like that of rugby as well. We had a guest, uh, Tim Widmore, on who talked about how um, people that went to school in, in smaller towns or smaller communities were much more likely uh, to be successful or to be an elite sports person. Uh, am I right in thinking that the first school you went to had eight students total? Yeah, yeah. At a time, there was eight <laughs> kids, yeah. Me and my sister were told them as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a oh, small school. Great. Like, I remember like five years oh when I was five six and seven I think I went there and we had our own like native areas like that was how cool our school was we just went on school trips like we'd obviously only need one van and we went here there and everywhere like yeah my principal Mary Cummings gave us a really cool life when I was at primary school so I'm really grateful for that and was it were you one of those kids that was talented at most sports or was it always rugby no nah, like um i loved most sports and i loved playing any kind of sport but i didn't play rugby until i was at high school um and like i don't, I, I played like a little bit obviously at um my first school there was only eight so when they had a team you had kind of had to jump in but um, i wouldn't say i played it but like i remember one um one year i didn't want to play netball and that's what I did and my sister was doing gymnastics didn't want to do that because I they wouldn't let me wear shorts um <laughs> so I decided that I would go to the rugby sign out with my brother and he was like four years younger so he had his mates there and I remember turning up and there was like no girls in the line like there was I don't know a couple of hundred kids and there, I don't didn't see one girl and I think I was like 11 or 12 at the time and 
um, my mum said, oh, are you going to go sign up? You need to go, like, write your name down and get a mouth card. And I was like, oh, no, nah, I'm not going to play rugby this year. And she was like, oh, okay. Like, she never pushed us to do anything. It was like we asked and she would say yes. And if you didn't, then that was sweet. So she was like, oh, yep, sweet. And then um, and then I ended up playing hockey because of some other reason. But, like, I look back at that and I'm like, damn, that's like a real missed opportunity. And for me, like, I hope that never happens to a girl nowadays. Like, I really hope that they turn up to a rugby club and that there is at least just one girl or one person helping out with the signing that will encourage them to stay there. And I know that's happening around New Zealand. Um, Renee and Portia have a, their daughters and all girls team that they help coach and bear plenty and, and things like that, which is awesome for these kids. But yeah, so me, I wanted to probably play rugby at a little bit earlier age, but didn't get to until went to high school and then obviously loved it. But yeah. As a, a rugged farm girl in fielding, did the <laughs> Māori culture play a big role in your childhood? Um, no, not at all. Um, we didn't grow up um, in Te Ao Māori or we didn't speak the language. Um, to be honest, we didn't talk about being Māori at all. It was like, I don't know, it was just a Kiwi and that was me. Um, and like my mum's Māori and, but yeah, she left home at a young age, like her grandparents spoke Te Reo Māori, um, but it never got passed down to them. And um she just said that they just never talked about it and that was just about it. So, um, but until like, in at high school, like I wanted to learn the language, but then I don't know why I didn't, I just didn't carry it on. And um, But it's since probably being in this team in the Blackfin Sevens team where I've really encouraged myself to explore our language, um, actually my whakapapa and where I'm from and um, trying to, encourage the rest of my whanau to do so and I think with getting to a stage like I've got so much more information than I've ever had um my sister talks to her um daughter and son and in, in bits and tereo and um so like just doing that on a regular basis has helped and it's so amazing hearing people like Stacey and Portia speak fluently in our team because like I want that and I know that that's hard but I now know that I'm really proud to be Māori and I think being at a boarding school where you're one of three Māoris and the 200 kids like that's a really daunting thing and I don't know like you can't you didn't really get teased but you knew you were a little bit like obviously darker than everyone else um and I don't know whether that was because we didn't have a lot of money so I knew that while we were struggling to just be in there and um so like but now I'm like I'm so proud to be Māori I'm so proud to do the haka sing waiata um speak the tiny little bit of te reo that I know and um yeah I want to keep learning more because I know how um how special it is to to be Māori in New Zealand it's a pretty uh, I come from a mixed race household myself so my mum's from the Solomon Islands my dad was English and it is a pretty it's a Difficult thing to navigate when you're younger, not really feeling like you fit in either camp, but then when you do finally embrace or feel comfortable to to be who you are, it's a real liberating thing, eh? Like, and you that thirst for knowledge and that wanting to know more and more about your background, where you come from, what you connect with, is super super empowering and charging, eh? It is super awesome and then like I've connected with a lot of cousins and stuff and they speak to deal and like that's really powerful for me so yeah being able to make those connections has been awesome and I actually believe it's because of this team like I'm really grateful for that. Your um, husband uh, Connor right? Connor? Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, he's I understand a, a big rugby fan, huge rugby fan from what I've heard. Uh, what is that what does that dynamic look like when you're playing games? Is he giving you feedback? Is he telling you what he thinks? Or or do you take it on board? Or, or how, how does that work? He 100% tells me what he thinks. And that's what I love about him. Like, he's brutally honest to me and probably my, my definitely my number one supporter. But he'll tell me when um, I'm not going so well. So, like, we have a really good relationship. Um, he is 100% supportive of what I do. I 
would normally outside of COVID would travel all the time. So I'm, I'm away a lot, which is um, not always easy, but like just constant phone calls, FaceTimes and whatever. And he will sit up during the night and watch all of our games because like he genuinely wants to support our team, see how we're going. And he just really loves rugby. So I know that when the seven started at the Olympics, he watched all the men's games, like all the um, New Zealand men's, but every single team. And then he he similar when we started, he watched all of our games and every single other team. So then when we got to that team, he's like, "Okay, what's the game plan?" I'm like, <laughs> and then I'd, I'd give him I'd give him what I reckon we're gonna do. And he's like, "Yeah, sweet," because I've seen this and they play played <laughs> this team, and, and it was like it's nice, like. Um, there's times where I'm like, okay, that's enough. Like, I don't want to talk about rugby. And he's like, oh, yeah, sweet. And we'll talk about something else. But when I really need to talk about rugby, he will 100% be there and will fully commit to us talking about rugby. So it's cool. <laughs> he's um, very, very well, well invested in our team and obviously knows the girls real well and stuff too. So, yeah, I'm um, like, obviously, really grateful to have a supportive husband and, um, holds the fort down at home and takes care of the dog and stuff like that but yeah and I think that's why like he chucked a photo off of me and the gold medal and said like congratulations or whatever but I wrote a comment back and said like we did it and for me like we we both did it like he's been there right from the start um like before Rio and stuff like that so yeah, like he knows how hard we've had to work to get to this moment and um, I can't wait to celebrate that with him in a couple of days. When you when you won gold and that first, was it a FaceTime back to him? Like did, did he have a party at your house? Did he have friends around? Like what was that saying? <laughs> he definitely had a party and oh gosh, for the next couple of days I think maybe they went for, but um, his, oh, we've lucky his family moved up so they all live within five, ten minutes of us now and um, like he just had all of his family, a few of our mates around to the house and he said he was actually real nervous um, just because he knew if we didn't win what that would mean and how I would be feeling if, if, that, if that happened. So yeah, when we won and I've seen a few videos his mum took of them and the place just goes nuts, like all the boys are hugging and, um, and stuff like that. So that was cool and then he I rang him it would have been really late in New Zealand when by the time I got back to my phone and um the phone comes up and I can just hear like everyone screaming just because they were still there so it was a really <laughs> cool phone call and he was just yeah absolutely over the moon and um yeah obviously I've talked to him a lot since then but even now he's just like yeah just hurry up and get home with that medal I can't wait so yeah well you've 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 referenced you guys were together before Rio. It's probably impossible to go through a conversation without reflecting on on Rio. Now you were one of, I think, seven in the group that won gold, that got silver or took silver in in Rio. So how much sweeter was it to to do that with some of those that went through that same experience? Yeah, that oh, like amazing. Like Ruby's obviously in interviews carrying her silver medal around as well as her gold and. I think that's what it meant for a few of us. Like that's what built the last five years for a lot of us in a better program and changing the culture and doing things and not leaving anything unturned. And um, like after the, the Rio games, a lot of us had family there and it was just like absolute heartbreak. It felt like we'd let everyone down. Um, but then, yeah, obviously they say that they're proud of you and they love you and stuff, but like there were some yeah pretty dark times when you're waking up in the middle of the night worried about a game and just knowing you didn't achieve a goal and so like kind of seeing me go through all of that and um even with like the captaincy side he's seen a lot of stuff like some rough times so to be able to change that all around and then win gold and like even with stuff around like the medal, um, obviously the New Zealand team doing really well, and I'd send him a screenshot like, "Where the most, oh, this is the most successful team New Zealand has ever had," and he's like, "Yeah, you're a part of that. Like, that's one of your." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, true." Like he's just a constant reminder of how how awesome it's been the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, being able to share moments like that with him is is awesome, and oh, as well as the rest of my family, like it's yeah, 
like my family have been absolutely over the moon the last two weeks so it's been cool and ruby said she carried her medal around silver medal around with her the whole time what did you do with yours is yours somewhere around as well or is it tucked away in a drawer somewhere my husband actually asked me that and i was like oh i don't know but i do school visits for the new zealand olympic team um so there's that like the silver medal and the con games medal and the rugby world cup medal all in the same bag so they're all in a safe place together but i did have to think oh i haven't touched that bag in a while so but i'm sure they'll stay in that bag and this one will be the one that's out most <laughs> of the time now <laughs> now you've just alluded to, to one of the other cool facts which is i think you're one of five that has literally won everything that there is to win in rugby gold gold medal at the olympics world cup sevens world series sevens and uh a rugby world cup as well do you in miq now reflect on that and think oh, what's next or is there still a drive to be like well now i've got to go and defend all these things there's definitely been a time like i've spoken to a couple of other girls who have been in the same boat and um like we're like holy that's just nuts really um and like i still feel like we're still quite young and still have a lot of time in us so there was yeah there's been a couple of times i'm like do i really want to carry on like i'm pretty happy right now and um but i do like i know my body's still got a lot left in me and um i like i'm definitely eyeing up paris 2024 that's that's a goal so um but then you think far out like like it, it, you could easily just leave on a high like you could easily like I could easily stop and be like oh, I've won everything and whatever but like I know if my body's good enough then I might as well keep trying to make things and same with this three pinnacle events next year com games sevens rugby world cup 15th rugby world cup and I would love to put my hand up for all three just because and it's not even about like going there to defend your title anymore like for me I love going to those tournaments because of the memories I've had to make like the um rugby world cup 2017 in Ireland with the 15s girls was one of the funnest trips I've ever been on um and it was quite cool my mum was there for the whole month in, in Ireland traveling around so yeah just hanging out with people um having a good time and doing some rugby on the side that's probably why I go go on trips now do you have any inkling about what sort of career you might take on when it's time to hang up the boots? Um, yeah, like I've, um, I've got a degree in Māori and sports science, so I, I don't know if I want to use it, but I've definitely got a little bit of balance there and um, I'm actually doing my private pilot's licence at the moment, so potentially a pilot and... Um, then me and my husband have a rugby academy and a rugby club and shout out to Matikisi Rugby. Um, but um, yeah, there's stuff I want to do in rugby outside of playing professionally. Um, and, and I don't know how that looks or whatever at the moment, but like I love having balance. I love doing something outside of the set training and stuff like that because I, I get bored quite easily. So yeah, I like being busy. <laughs> Well, just after talking to you for over an hour, however long it's been, um, the character you've shown, especially through the, the adversity over the last six months and coming through that to achieve such success, it will cross over into anything after this sport. Like any workplace would, would eat you up because you, you're exactly the sort of character that everyone wants around. So, yeah, the world is your oyster. Um, we won't keep you too much longer, but Shay, is there a few last things you want to tick off the list? Yeah, I'm really, I just want to delve a little bit further into the musical cues for the team. So Stan Walker, Aotearoa, I think, is that three minutes or something before game time? I'm going to say like three minutes, 24 or something like that. I've seen it on the love, often enough. <laughs> yeah, I love the detail. But are there any other, are there any other, I think, is it, um, is, is Gail the DJ, the team DJ, or her playlist public? Yeah. Oh, um, is it SoundCloud? Um, I think your playlist might be public. I'm not too sure. But yeah, yeah, she's the music guru in our team. Her and Tanika Willison. And how much truth to you being able to turn a Nicki Minaj lyric word for word? <laughs> Where are you getting this information from? <laughs> well, is it factual or not? <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. That's probably the one thing I can do outside of serious rugby stuff. <laughs> What's the go-to Minaj track? Um, super bass. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, I have it on good I can't good do much authority. else. Like, the girls can actually sing and dance and do their TikToks, and I'm like, just this one thing, and that's all. And then every time it gets played, like everyone just looks at me. I'm like, no, leave me alone. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing <laughs> if we actually had it? <laughs> if we had it queued up and we could play it now, that would be amazing. <laughs> but we don't have that technological capability. Thankfully for you. I'm glad. I'm so glad about that. <laughs> yeah. Um. And and just lastly for me, what's it been like? Your profile has obviously blown up over the last two weeks. Um. You seem to be everywhere. Like I say, you're in such hot demand. Um. Is this is this is this really unusual for you? And how are you dealing with it? Has it become overwhelming, or are you are you open to having so much exposure? Oh, like I think for our team, it's it's awesome. It's amazing. Um, like our program's getting a lot of credit that it deserves, and the more exposure that you sign up for media, then the more the team's going to get. And I think in that sense, it's going to be awesome for Sevens. Um, I know there's been a lot of young girls watching our program, wanting to be a part of our team, and I hope that it is that way. And I hope we've inspired a lot of people to. One, want to be a part of our team. Two, follow it because I think our team's pretty awesome. And um, and I think getting the stereotype of rugby and women's rugby and stuff, um, like I think it's changed a lot over the last couple of weeks. So that's been amazing. I think on a, like a personal side, it's oh, it's all good for me. Like at the moment, I'm hiding behind a phone. Um, all my media is done for a screen and um, all the attention's come through social media. So I can easily switch that off and and not have to talk to anyone because I'm still in MIQ but I think getting messages from a husband back home like random people in the gym will come up to him and ask when his wife's home and he's like I have no idea who these people are and I think he's like it's gonna be a lot different to what you were used to when like people know who you are but as Kiwis are quite shy about expressing that and normally you walk down and people will stare and just kind of murmur to themselves and then that's about it but like he's like, I think it's going to be a lot different for you guys when you get home. And like, I'm actually really proud of that. And I know sometimes it might get a little bit too much, but that's like, for me, that's what our team's been about. It's about expressing our team as best that we can, showing the world that we are just normal, genuine people who love playing rugby. And if that's why they love our team, then I'm I'm pretty proud of that. So yeah, well, I'll maybe ask me when I've got back home and we'll see what goes on. But um, <laughs> I think I think it's awesome for our program. And I think if yeah, if our team can get a lot more exposure, um, then that's going to be a real beneficial thing for futures moving forward. Hey, that has been so good, Sarah. Um, yeah, I'm so excited for you guys to get out of there and to bond together and share in that celebration and share it with the public and share your gold medal with all the people around you who have worked so hard alongside you. Uh, so, yeah, congratulations. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Uh, Shay, any last words? Uh, just an absolute wonderful ambassador, not only for New Zealand, for women's rugby, but for your whānau and, and for yourself. It's been amazing to have you on here I, I hope as many people as possible can kind of listen and follow along to this and uh we will stop you in the street if we ever see you and um <laughs> and make sure make sure that we introduce ourselves properly and not through a screen <laughs> no all good um do you guys want to see the middle i've got it handy yeah show us the middle yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there we go team Look yeah it's that. pretty cool eh? yeah you're part of a golden stable now huh? cultivate group Emma Twig, yourself, um, <laughs> Portia, Kelly, Gail, you guys are uh, really, um, yeah, really bringing it home for, for Kelly and Cultivate Group. A little shout out to them for um, for hooking us up with you as well. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, no, it's like, it's awesome. Um, hi, yeah, Kelly's amazing. She's obviously been having to deal with a few things over the phone the last couple of weeks for us, but um yeah for me it's nice having a female manager they understand exactly how i'm getting on and stuff like that so yeah shout out to kelly and cultivate group but yeah it's been an awesome successful campaign for us all 
good luck for your next six podcasts across your next six nights. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to keep changing up my stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Sarah. Awesome.